Welcome to the female decade with all the three ingredients. Should I repeat? Welcome to the female decade with digital life design and social impact. So, Edith, who are you? Edith Harel Kapaton is a friend of mine. <laughs> I shouldn't read this, I know it. <laughs> and, a and a friend of DLD for many years. It's her fifth DLD. She always finds it fun and, so, and inspiring, I hope so. <laughs> oh, no, I don't, I don't read it, it's, it's stupid. Edith is a gifted woman. She was the first Israeli um, graduated from Harvard. She worked with Nicholas Negroponte on the MIT. Um, she started Mama Media in 1985 an award-winning website, the first for kids and parents in the early internet days. Um, 2005, I, I did start the worldwide workshop um, to match the needs of young people with economic opportunities for the 21st century. Her newest invention, Global Loria Network, is growing successfully in USA schools. Um, but she also likes to saw, I read here, and sawing is you know, Buddha style, Buddha, Buddha media, it's the starting of, it's the origin of Hubert Buddha media. But this is not on Hubert Buddha media now, it's on nine women who really made a difference. It did come on stage. What we are talking about. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steffi and uh, Maria, and to all the DLD dedicated staff that made this amazing two days. Let's clap for them. I mean, we are the last ones, and uh, this incredible group of women, women that will come on the stage, we are promising you all nine of us, to make this last uh, 90 minutes the most exciting and energizing and inspiring for you to take home. So let me call them one by one. Um, the, the first one who will come up is Mitchell Baker, Vozilla Foundation. And then uh, Joanna Bredenbach, please come up. Oslem Denisman, please come up. Look at them. Constance Fritzen, please come up. And Jamu Green, your turn to come up. And Isabel Maxwell, please come up. And Suhua Newton, please come up. And then we have Juliana Rotish, please come up. Voila, my mic up. Just look at that. It obviously is the most diverse and uh, the most entrepreneurial panel we had here since we started yesterday morning. And my first question to the panelists is, what is this that makes you wake up every morning and work on your mission? These are all women with really big dreams but the nice thing about these women is that they have a very big vision, but they also know how to execute. So let's start with Mitchell Baker. What is this that makes you up every morning and work so hard on the thing that you're working on? Well, the only thing that wakes me up in the morning is the alarm clock, but, um, and the lure of some whipping cream in my coffee because I'm always tired. But, but once I stumble out of bed and get started, uh, the thing that keeps me going each day is the promise of the internet. It's, it's so clear how much value, and how much social value and individual value and sort of the bright promise of the internet and it's equally clear how big brother and dark and frightening the internet can be. And so it's that promise that, that drives us forward. Uh, the Mozilla Foundation is about, we're best known for Firefox, but we're about building a layer of the internet that's non-commercial and that's built on respect for human dignity and individual empowerment. And so, yay, thank you. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but each of the missions here sort of, I, I think, warrants, warrants that response. 
So we do that through software. We recognize that advocacy and policy work is important, but we believe that what's unique about Mozilla is that through the software we produce, we can put in the hands of individual consumers a tool that both respects us individually, but gives us op options and choice, and allows us to move beyond just raw consumption into creativity and influencing our own lives. That's great. So we're going to move in alphabetical order. Joanna, betterplace.org, what is it that makes you wake up every morning and work so hard? Well, first of all, it is my children, which I have to get ready for school. Um, but then, from then on, I really am full of fire for my, the company I co-founded, a startup based in Berlin called Better Place Org. And I'm an anthropologist, and as an anthropologist, I m know quite a bit about why development aid has failed in so many areas of life and in the world. And three years ago, or four years ago, I went on a trip with my family uh, around the world for five months. And we found some amazing projects, local grassroots projects by people who had identified local needs and then developed self-initiative and did something in order to better their situation. And when we came back uh, from this trip, we thought, God, you know, we really want to give a platform and we want to give exposure to these kind of grassroots projects all over the world, which can really make a difference. So we teamed up with some other, a group of other people who had a very similar idea. And what we have been doing is a platform open to everybody. So everybody can post their project, be they an NGO or a local initiative or an individual, and can say, this is who I am, this is what I do, and this is exactly what I need in order to fulfill my project money, time, expertise, or donations in kind. And what we really are for and what we are fighting for is more transparency and more accountability in the social sector, especially in Germany, because the situation really is not very good, you know, and the, I think, I mean, I would follow Mitchell there. The internet can have such a huge impact in order to, to really bring these very, very important values, transparency and accountability forward. And my last thing would be what I really am really feel very passionate about is that the internet enables people to have a voice which so far haven't had a voice. And these are in our world of the NGO world, these are especially the beneficiaries, people who are really the end consumers of the services NGOs offer. But we very rarely hear from them. And Better Place is a platform where these beneficiaries can have a voice and say, this is a project, you know, I am in a refugee camp there and there, and this is how I experience you know, the value, but also, you know, maybe the disadvantages of this social initiative. So that is something I'm really, that gets me up in the morning. And Thank stays, you so and much. Let me stay up for a long time. Now, we, we all had a fabulous hour, fabulous hour before we came here. And we could have gone on and on and on. And we made a decision that we're going to talk very fast about who we are, what's our mission and our vision, and a few other questions. But we promised to finish this very fast to allow us to interact and have a conversation. OK, Aslim, tell us about what is this that makes you work so hard every single morning? In a meeting in Italy, uh, in Brazil meeting, uh, Shimon Perez said, in order to solve the world's problems, we need to educate the mothers, the women. So that's what gets me up every morning thinking. Um, what uh, In Turkey, I'm from Turkey, we had the right to vote before Switzerland in 1935, women as women. And ever since then, some 9,000 uh, men came into the parliament, but only 236 women. And uh, in terms of uh, workforce, some 12% women are up uh, as CEOs, but only 26% are in the workforce of Turkey. And what I'm trying to do is to teach uh, mostly women and young uh, or youth about money management. Can I see hands? How many of you are managing our chief financial officers in your home, are managing your money? They all left at five. <laughs> okay, that's great. I assure you, those hands are much less in Turkey. So. <laughs> I wake up every morning trying to make that uh, more. I started a, a blog uh, and then a television show. I do a television show on CNBC, trying to make it very, very simple and reach as many people as uh, I can. And also trying to ignite other you know, uh, people and institutions. I just got a phone call uh, in, in, the, in the break from the Central Bank of Turkey, whom I had visited, that they said that they will also start a program uh, on wow. financial literacy in Turkey. So, a you new know. Client. 
Excuse me? It's a new client for you? Uh, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an institution when they do something, you know, it's a, my aim is trying to ignite and have more people like me, not just in Turkey, everywhere in the world, and also ignite institutions uh, in Turkey uh, to solve one of the problems, which is, you know, uh, economy and, uh, and uh, unemployment, etc., by empowering people uh, how to man ma manage their money life better. Because if you manage, uh, manage your money, uh, you also manage your life better. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's great. Thank Changing you. the life of women in Turkey. <laughs> okay, Constanza from Ashoka. Well, very concretely speaking, it's my uh, baby girl that wakes me up every day at 6 a.m. And the, <laughs> then there's the excitement that there's soon going to be a second one. They're probably going to wake me up at 5 a.m. <laughs> but um, I still manage to combine um, family and, and job somehow. And actually, it's working quite great. So, no, but um, professionally speaking, what I do is um, I have uh, launched, I founded Ashoka in Germany in 2003 and co-founded Ashoka in Western Europe. And so we set up the infrastructure for social entrepreneurs. So what I've been, you know, fortunate to do over the last years is really dig for talents, find those men and women in the civil sector who have uh, new ground-breaking ideas uh, to solve social problems and help them get better at what they do by leveraging them through financial support, through visibility, through networks. And um, this has been an incredible, rewarding time. And I've been also fortunate to work with entrepreneurs from everywhere in the world, from microcredit in Pakistan to um, social housing in Brazil to gender issues or immigration issues in Germany. And what I'm doing now is looking at um, clusters of social entrepreneurs at the global level. Uh, for example, currently we are working with a bunch of Ashoka fellows, Ashoka social entrepreneurs who use mobile technology to reach bottom of the pyramid customers, so the poorest of the poor. And we are looking at what are the barriers that prevent them from scaling their projects and how can we remove those. And, um, you know, it, it's really, it's, 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 it's not a job, it's really a profession. And, and the nice thing is that it's, it feels like, when I work, it feels like it's a playground and you can constantly create and make networks and new connections and see certain things and size on opportunities. And it's just a very, yeah, a very rewarding life. Feel the energy. All right. And Jammu, what is this that makes you wake up everything in the morning with a smile like this? I recently moved to New York City, so I'm still getting used to such a large city. So actually every morning I wake up and just want to see the city before all the masses of people <laughs> are awake. And I'm just thrilled every single day to get to work at the Women's Media Center to amplify the voices of women in a media uh, infrastructure that uh, still, in a sense, leaves out half the population. And we do that through training and advocacy and publishing our own original content. Uh, my most favorite part of my day is working with our progressive women's voices participants who go through an intensive training program with us and start writing op-eds and start getting booked as commentators on CNN and Fox and MSNBC and to see their progression as they build their media platform and through their words change the conversation in the media definitely gets me up every day. On the flip side, uh, because we do have to hold the media outlets accountable for their very sexist and biased coverage, uh, especially as it uh, relates to women candidates, I also have to get up every day knowing that there's going to be something said, something done in the media that we're going to have to push back and uh, show outrage and hold them accountable for misrepresenting women. And through training young women to find their media voice and holding media companies accountable, I am psyched to wake up every morning. All right. <laughs> And a little secret about Jamu, she does all that while she also sings. We just took a picture outside, and do you want to just uh, give us a taste of that? Yeah. Sing your name. Sing my name. Yeah, improvise. That's what we do best, right? I gladly walk across the desert with no shoes upon my feet to share with you the last part. The bread I had to eat. That's a taste of the Judds. I'm a country music singer.
so much fun leading to Isabel Maxwell, please. Well, that's very inspiring to follow. <laughs> So, uh, what gets me up in the morning these days is that one billion people on the planet do not have access to fresh drinking water. Small problem. <laughs> and uh, really, I come to this from a, a decade and a half of working. I have a first life in uh, uh, documentary film and feature film production in the UK and the US, in California, and then a second life in high tech. I founded a, one of the, the earlier search engines on the web, and then I ran a Israeli email and messaging company, and I've done a lot of uh, effort in peace building and also in philanthropy that I do to this day in Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East. And as I looked at this from that vantage point, I looked at the really huge global threats that affect us all in the world today. And they are climate change, water shortage, nuclear proliferation, medical pandemics, and Middle East peace. And what I thought really, what was a commonality that all of them had that I might perhaps really try to work on to move the needle? And the truth is that we are living with nuclear proliferation and we are living through pandemics and we are living with climate change. But one thing none of us can live without is water. We will die if we do not have access to water. And by 2025, if we haven't done something about it, 66% of all of us will be living with water shortage. So my mission is actually some, to build an environmentally and economically sound solution to delivering water. And we are building a fleet of ships that actually will deliver something. It's not new desalination. This is desalination on ships. They all got 1% as the crews that they go around. But this is to have ships that are 99% desalination and 1% for everything else. So that in one fell swoop, each ship can actually deliver 40% 40 million cubic meters of water every single day, that's 150,000 liters of, cube of water every day to regions and cities and countries in need of water. So this is a, a very important thing that can actually deliver water at scale. And the other critical thing about it is that you can, in some instances, you can actually start taking water off the table as a conflict item. Imagine if we'd had these ships now, we would have had a ship off, off Gaza, you could have had a ship at Haiti and so on in Africa, and the list goes on. So that is really what wakes me up every single day, and uh, we're very excited to be on it. I, I can't, I, if you ask me offline, I could go on at, at length about it, but I'm very honored to be working on this mission and to share it with you today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Su Hua Newton, tell us a little bit about what makes you excited every, bad, every day that you get up. as well as depends upon which country I'm in. I'm a winemaker, and so during harvest, I walk the vineyard every day, so it depends on the weather. If it is thunderstruck, I hide underneath the blanket. <laughs> if it's a glorious day, I'm out of bed by five o'clock. And um, the other half of my life is I'm part of the Doctors Without Borders, I'm the team leader, and so it depends upon which country, and when, and why. That's great, and you're doing things for kids. Well, I think, very, I believe very strongly, uh, while I was a professor at the medical school, is the fact that you have to give with your heart, and that's all what life is about. I have received a lot, I have to turn around and give, and I say to my students, I'm giving you guys far more than just basic information. Turn around when your time comes and give. And thus, together, we create a better tomorrow. I'm part of the Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy structure and the profit from the wine that I sell, very expensive wine. <laughs> After good, the session. No. <laughs> go towards the program for kids at risk, and I have 49 kids who work with me to create a better tomorrow. Thank you so much. Juliana, tell us about your day. What makes you keep on going and doing the huge project that you're doing? What excites me every morning is I get to wake up and log in and work with amazing developers from around the world, mm -hmm. creating software that uh, enables organizations and individuals to crowdsource information, particularly cri uh, crisis information, 
and also creating tools for democratizing information, be it uh, information from mobile phones or uh, web information. We create tools to make these things um, better and to give a voice to people around the world. That's fantastic. Now you, you probably already figured out that we all come from different places, we operate in different places, and we have really big, big missions. So maybe we can just go one from here to here and just say, where were you born, where are you from, where are you operating from, and one word about your mission. I was born in Kenya. I currently, uh, apart from the internet, I split my time uh, between Nairobi and Chicago. And um, my mission is to basically continue making software that helps uh, get information into the public sphere and uh, democratizes information online, uh, and that's Ushahidi and Swift River. Democratizing information online. Thank you. So I'm the child of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and this is why I'm so emphatic about education. Hopefully, through education, we will have a better tomorrow and no more war. Thank you. Mitchell. Uh, well, I'm a classic Californian through and through. Classic uh, Californian. <laughs> um, I said, but Mozilla is global in ones and twos around the world in towns that are really quite astonishing where you find Mozilla communities. So I, I echo Juliana and say, you know, we're from the internet. <laughs> internet land. Well, I was born in Hamburg. Uh, my company is based in Berlin, where I also live. I studied in Munich anthropology, but then I went to Berkeley and to London, and I did field work in China, Russia, Belize, and some other places. And uh, my mission would be, um, in one word, to um, use digital media to radically transform the social sector. Amazing. Yes, Anta. I'm born in Istanbul. I was educated and lived a long time in the United States. And my mission is actually is in two folds. One is to teach, especially Turkish women and youth, about money, daily life money. And also, the second one is to be a role model, as that you can be a mother of two. I'm also a corporate executive and also a social entrepreneur. And so you can, you know, we can do it at once and, and inspire. And a graduate of MIT. Right. <laughs> um, I was born in Germany in the Rhineland area. I spent uh, part of my teenage years in Costa Rica in Latin America. I lived in the UK and then I became an anthropologist as well and spent considerable time in India and Israel. And now I'm back in Germany based in Frankfurt and um, yeah, I can't really say which country I'm working on because it changes <laughs> and it shifts uh, from one to the other. And the mission is I, it's, it's hard to kneel down, but I guess it's empowering people to make change. Thank you. Jamu. My parents immigrated from Liberia to the U.S., so I'm a first-generation American born in Washington, D.C., but I am through and through a Texan. I grew up in Austin, Texas, <laughs> and now reside in New York uh, because New York is the place that I have to be to make sure that women are empowered in the media, my personal mission uh, throughout my entire career has been to give voice to those who don't have one. So from Liberia via Texas to New York City. Isabel. So my father was Czech, my mother is French, I was born in France, I was raised in England, had an Oxford education and then went to try to get off the British Isles to get further away from my, my folks to Edinburgh and from thence to California and three years living and working also in Israel but also working there for 14 years, so I call myself definitely international. I'm now back in Southern California, but our, our water mission is all over the world, and the bases are in Israel, in uh, Brussels, in the United States, and uh, really, as I said, it's our, our mission is actually to really help uh, lessen water shortage in the world, but also dramatically to take it off the table as a conflict item. Well, I think this just speaks for itself. There is talent everywhere. There is talent everywhere. We are from very, very diverse backgrounds. Everybody can. 
be a social entrepreneur, especially in this day and age with uh, digital technology and virtual collaborative um, workplace. But what is so interesting, so fascinating, as I was talking to all of our panelists here, is how they designed their own life in such a multicultural and multi-challenge way. And it, it's just fascinating. And we probably can go on and on. Well, based on the, on the issues that were discussed here in the panels in the last two days, I have a question for each of you. And again, we can go once, once, once more around, and then we're going to start opening for question. Um, did anybody ever stop you? Did anybody ever block you? We heard a lot about women talking about the fact that they wanted to do something or they can't do something because they're a woman or because there are certain limitations. But look at that. So let's hear your stories. Do you have a story? Do you have a story? Do you have a, you have a story, Isabel? Um, I think we were not going to do that one. <laughs> well, well I had two like take a microphone. One of the fun things, of, of course, being Chinese, being a woman, the first Chinese and the first woman to be making a wine that is total departure from most people. I make a I have a vineyard that is organic. I make the wine that is totally free of chemicals, free of yeast, and no filtration. And what is fun is because I'm Chinese, I'm a woman, wherever I've gone to make the promotion for my product, is like today, I walk into the restaurant, and the guy, I do not know who he is, he immediately say, hello, Dr. Newton. <laughs> and being Chinese, being a woman, is a huge advantage. <laughs> so, so <laughs> that's a great story. Mitchell, we talked earlier about the fact that there are certain things every day that you need to, to overcome, you know, some, some things about your daily life that you kind of are, you know, we all look so happy and fulfilled and, you know, there is always, we, all of us women, when we are social entrepreneurs and we run all these uh, big projects, uh, people think everything is easy, you know, it just works, they just know what they're doing, but it's not always the case. Well, this, this might tie a little into your last question, too. I, I don't think anybody has overtly tried to stop me because nobody's really known what I've been trying to do. Ah, <laughs> good trick. <laughs> and uh, now that, that Mozilla and Firefox have achieved some success, you know, it, it's clearer and we have more opportunity to describe what we're doing, but, but in the early days, you know, we were, we were really silly and childish, and so to your current question, uh, the thing that, that is difficult each day is, you know, we're heading into the unknown. And we have these giant missions, all of us, and, and I think many of us, no one's done it before. There's no clear path. The model of how you build a business or how you do X or how you build a financial institution doesn't really apply. Many of us are nonprofits. I know Ushahidi is, we are. And so we live in the market, but we're a nonprofit organization. So what does that mean? Uh, and so it's heading off into the unknown, having enough confidence that it doesn't matter that none of the titans of industry understand what I'm trying to do, you know, it's worth trying to do anyway, and then just making up every day, well, how am I going to try and do it today? Uh, maybe it's wrong, maybe a, what I try today doesn't work, but I need to try something and, you know, need to figure it out and, and plunge ahead, because there's no known path. No known path, change leaders have to really invent their day and invent their solutions as they go along. Joanna, do you want to add something to this? Well, when you asked about what is stopping me, I mean, I'm sometimes more afraid that no, but not, nothing is stopping me. And I, you know, I, I'm really grateful sometimes to my children, my husband, my friends who say, listen, you know, I mean, do we see something else of you? Can we talk about something else but better place? And so that is something, you know, I mean, I do find a challenge to, to I love what I'm doing, I really do. And, but it gets so overwhelming, and I mean that I sometimes do lose track of other things which are also really important in my life, and you know that's I think a challenge for me. Thank you. Yes, quick one. I feel woman or man, there's always challenge, always stoppers. But in my case, I really believe that I listen to the voice that's coming from within me, and if one day it says that it's it, you know, you're done with your mission, I think that's the only time I will stop. Constanza. <laughs> I guess, you know, we, we all started something from scratch. So we entrepreneured something. And as, as an entrepreneur, you invent. So it's, it's, it's a very lonely task because you're creating something that isn't there yet. 
and um, and that is very difficult. I mean, you get a lot of friends when you're successful, but at the beginning, you know, um, uh, the friends are rare, and you need to convince people one by one to uh, support you, to follow your mission, to give you money, to give you networks. And um, so, you know, it's been a very tough time, or it's a very tough time to start up an enterprise. And, um, yeah, and, and I guess uh, you have to uh, have this deep belief in yourself why you think you're doing this, uh, but uh, you cannot really count on a supportive environment right from the start. Well, this is amazing. So many points of view for this one issue. You, you're lonely. You have to continue and believe in yourself. You can't even always share with your team that you're struggling and you don't really know how, what you're going to do today. And you have to also have confidence that there maybe there are, there are things bigger uh, than you and that you have to just figure out how to deal. I see Isabel is, oh, Jamu, I, I yes, I, please. I, okay. Um, I, um, I think my entire life people have tried to put me in a box, whether that started with being the daughter of immigrants and you know, how I was supposed to be like an immigrant in Texas or uh, as an African-American, um, the fact that I supported Hillary Clinton over Barack Obama was a box that made a lot of people in my life upset with, even especially since I had been president of Rock the Vote and had worked for many years to get young people engaged in the process. No one understood why I wasn't going with all of the young people who were supporting uh, President Obama at the time. And you know whether it was when I was five years old and pushing back from the box that they tried to put me in, or a year ago uh, in the presidential elections, I think it is absolutely important not to let people define you for who they think you are based on who your parents are, based on your geography, based on uh, whatever sort of external factor they're looking at. It is about defining your own sets of boxes and multiple places you can be and um, how you can portray yourself in all times of your life. Start inventing your boxes. And also think about some good questions that are out of the box. Yes, Isabel. Um, yeah, I, I, the story that I was not going to say, and I'm not going to say, it was just a, a story about dealing with a, a lot of male enmity in my, a television station that I had in the old days. I don't actually want to go there. I really wanted to say about things that stop you. I think a lot of times when you're making your companies, you have really bad days and a lot of difficulties and decisions to make. And, th and, and it's really scary sometimes. Something, sometimes things go horribly wrong. And I found that I just had to have the courage to get through the bad days, to pick up the phone and deal with the problems that you have to deal with, and there are many. And I just thought of a, one thing that my dad said about, he had wonderful homilies about things, and I was in my company at a time, there was a very difficult situation with somebody who was highly, highly disruptive. He was a, an executive, and finally he just said to me, Isabel, better a horrible ending than horrors without end. And that gives you courage to actually finish something because sometimes you don't have the courage to go and it goes on and on. And that helped me know when to finish things. Well, that's great advice. Yes, Juliana. Um, as a girl geek, we're very few. And an African girl geek, even fewer. So <laughs> we're finding that the dynamics of women in open source are very different. Um, first of all, just a quick... I have a brain crush on Mitchell Bacon. <laughs> but, um, wait, wait a second. I have to make a comment about brain crushes. I think we didn't really cover that when we talked about erotic capital. Yeah. I think brain crush is a huge uh, thing yeah. among all of us. And I think um, there, there are brains and ways of thinking and way of acting and way of being that are, are so sexy and that are, are so compelling. And I think that that is something that we hope our panel is communicating here to end DLD Women Conference. <laughs> Brain crashes. Yeah. So um, as women in open source, uh, we're finding that the dynamics of innovating in the open are a bit different and it's a different challenge. And we're finding that we have to support each other because um, there's always that fear of failure, particularly if you're a woman developer. We have a, a growing community in Kenya working at, out of the innovation hub in Nairobi who are um, they're building confidence to be able to commit code because it's different when you're just... Um, innovating for a closed application that just sits somewhere, then you don't have to really face uh, criticism or uh, you know somebody saying, oh, this could be made better. But we're getting more confident in um, 
showing that we can also contribute to open source projects online and in effect uh, help the internet community because we are people of the internet too, even though, you know, African girl geeks, we're there. African girls geeks, yeah, we have to clap for that. <laughs> One last comment yeah. on that question. I think one of the fun things is the fact that I disagree with many of my fellow panelists here because I think that too often we take ourselves too seriously. And because of that, we put a lot of stress on ourselves. Quite often in a very important situation, I prefer to come across as an idiot. <laughs> and it's, That's innovative. Yes, and even though I went to Cambridge, I'm quite capable of being frightfully English. But at the same time, I'm also capable of saying, me know no English, me know nothing, me Chinese. <laughs> That's great. So as you're thinking about your question, I'm just going to do one more round. Something really interesting happened as I was talking to my friends here, and I asked them, do you have any mentor, any woman mentor, or man mentor, or someone who's a role model for you? And their answers were fascinating. I can't really miss the opportunity to share this with you. Isabel. Uh, my role model was actually my late father, the publisher Robert Maxwell. And I, my parents had nine children, and I'm number four and a half, because I'm <laughs> a twin. And uh, in that lineup, he made no distinction between boys and girls as to our education and our training, which he did 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, if he was there, and because he traveled immensely. But we had, uh, because of what he did, we had, in, every weekend, we had every single kind of person from politics from kings and queens and Nobel laureates and astronauts and goodness knows what that came through the house every, on almost every weekend that I can remember. And we as kids had to come and we, our job was to entertain everybody and anybody. And he was also a Labour Member of Parliament, so we had constituents that would come through. So it was very important training that whether you were uh, a Nobel laureate or a dustbin person, you had something to learn from him. And so it was our job to do just that and we, to entertain them and find out what they needed, whether they were Chinese or Russian or whatever their language. And that was a, a, huge, a huge and important training. And the other big one that he taught us, and I feel very lucky for that, was the, the uh, ability to ask for something that you needed and to reach for the sky and to reach for first, because if you reach for fourth, you just get fifth. So it gave me a lot of confidence and ability to knock on the doors that I needed to knock on in life and not to be frightened of doing it and also to be able to talk and be at ease in any kind of situation because whether you were a king or whether you were a dustman, we're all human beings, we all piss in the same pot, he used to say. And, uh, and uh, I felt very fortunate for that, for that kind of uh, uh, look on the world. Wonderful. Jammu. I've always found that it is more helpful to reach out to mentors who are different than me. Uh, the majority of my mentors have been white men. Uh, when I did a panel like this at Harvard one year with Roger Ailes, who was the president of Fox News, I reached out and said, uh, you know, can you help me? Can you mentor me? Um, even though I disagree with him on every single political issue there is, um, I have gotten tremendous uh, media help uh, from him. I think also, you know, through my professional career, one thing that was unfortunate to find is as I reached out to women uh, at various organizations or companies I was in, it was harder to get them to mentor me because of where we still are in society where sometimes it's just uh, one woman uh, trying to hold on to a certain percentage of the power pie. And uh, I think that we are pushing through that and, and seeing you know, greater increases in numbers and, and hopefully that will come to an end, but that still is a reality that sometimes uh, it's harder to find a mentor in a woman. Uh, and so I absolutely encourage people to Reach out to mentors who don't look like you, who don't think like you, uh, and you will find that the advice that they give you is really empowering. Very, very thoughtful advice and very honest. Thank you for sharing that. Constanza? Well, I want to pick up on the, the role model part. You asked whether we have had any role models, and um, you know, my answer also, and we discussed before, was no, actually not. I mean, I wish I, I, I had had, but um, I think I've had always the feeling that I never really fit in anywhere. And so I think it was also out of a feeling of loneliness that I you know, started to walk on, on the way that I'm going. Um, 
However, there have been people who were very supportive, you know, um, Bill Drayton, the father of social entrepreneurship, or, or, you know, also my parents, and even though it was sometimes like, you know, we don't know what you're doing, but, uh, you know, somehow you, you'll manage, uh, we, we believe in you. So I guess that, that's my personal lesson. Thank you. Anton. Well, I, I learn from everybody, every day, different aspects, but I could say three um, people, I... Um, Maria Callas is a singer. I love her because she touches the hearts. That's what I'm trying to do. And um, Mohamed Yunus, he's a Nobel laureate. He started a, a microcredit for uh, microfinance for women in Bangladesh. Now the model is all over the world. I went and found him and met him in Davos. I said, you know, Mr. Yunus, uh, you're my role model. And uh, please help me out here. How can I make my initiative more bigger? And uh, the third one is Hillary Clinton. And uh, as a strong woman and as also, you know, helping uh, for the cause of trying to educate uh, more women. And uh, I went and found her at the White House two months ago and <laughs> told her the same. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, role models, sometimes it gets very lonely. And, and role models are quite important sometimes to hang in there. And also when you're trying to meet them and, and then also ask for help. So Thank you. Okay, Joanna. Uh, well, when I was a university student here in Munich, I was a very diligent and very, you know, not very innovative student. And that also had to do with the sort of professors I had, because anthropology in Munich was very historically oriented. And I didn't really, although I knew there was something I was fascinated with, this multi-perspectivity of the world, I felt, you know, God, there's still something missing. And then I went to Berkeley and met Laura Nader, who's a professor. She's the sister of Ralph Nader. Uh, and she was a woman, although I also disagreed with her fiercely, she was so strong and so opinionated. And I was completely in awe. And I mean, she really she taught me that, you know, you can follow your passion, you can follow the kind of topics you want to research, and you just have to follow, you know, what you feel inside you. And um, I think I was 25 at the time, um, and I have been trying to do more and more of that, and it was really her um, who was the first uh, step. And my second, not role model, but my second inspiration is my husband, who is somebody who constantly thinks out of the box, and I have been with him together for a long, long time, and I find it amazingly inspiring to be with somebody who constantly challenges established wisdoms, and um, you know, I try to follow also what he does. Wow, thanks. Mitchell. Well, you know, on the mentor side, I never even knew what, that there were things as mentors or that people mentored other people or you could find people and ask. I mean, I, I really didn't have a clue how much of the world works when I started. So uh, I never had any formal mentors. And, and I say that, if, you know, if you think you don't know enough or don't have a clue or you're not in the class of people that knows how entrepreneurship or this or that works. Well, that, that's true of at least me and probably a few others up here too. So don't let it, don't let it stop you. Um, on the role model side, no, I certainly I try and learn. I try and look for uh, traits that people have that I could learn from. But I've never been able to see anyone and say, oh, I want to be like that. I, I've never had enough of a path um, in front of me. So. Uh, probably know on both counts. So we have a few that really didn't have, but they have it inside. And presidents, Muhammad Yanis, husbands, fathers, business uh, partners, and, and maybe even bosses. So it comes in so many ways and in so many shapes and, and, and kind of types of expertise. And maybe Su, Su Hua, what, who was your mentor or, or role model? Well, my adopted father who told me when I was a very little kid, do whatever you want and go after it. And he joke and say, unlike the English with a hook nose, if they fall, they break their nose. Whereas you already have a flat nose, you've got nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> we keep on hearing quotes from Swa Father. <laughs> He's good. I want to meet him. <clears throat> Please, Juliana. My inspiration. Uh, like Isabel was my late father. Um, he taught us uh, as the women, in, I mean the girls in, his fa in, our, in our family, I have brothers, that we could also be makers. There was a saw, he, we had a little workshop, and he actually showed me how to clean it. Um, I don't know how many other parents would say, we, we were never stopped from um, 
working with our hands or exploring the world. And the other person who's also very inspiring to me is Dr. Deborah Estrin. She's a leader in her field and she's a trailblazer in the field of uh, mobile networks. So definitely a big inspiration to a geek girl like me that uh, you can be curious about the world, you can be curious about science, and you can be a computer scientist and uh, fuss about uh, bits and bytes, and uh, it's quite all right. In fact, it's awesome. Wow, thank you. So if I can share my inspirations, my grandmother and mother taught me how to saw with Buddha patterns. And that was a really powerful experience because we were poor. We didn't have money to buy dresses, but fabrics that can encourage my creativity and productivity, that was always a yes. So that also led to entrepreneurship because I ended up uh, sewing and selling dresses to all my friends in high school and their mothers with Burda patterns. So that's kind of an interesting connection. <laughs> Um, and that was my first relationship with technology that led me to another uh, big mentor, which is Seymour Papert at MIT, that taught me that the best way to learn is to do, is to act, is to make stuff. And lastly, and that's a lead to our next phase of this panel, my father, since I was three, used to come every day home from work, and he will tell me, do you have a really hard question for me? Just think about that. From age three, I had to think really hard every day, you know, to kind of come up with a good, hard question. Now, do you have one for us? I'm going to walk to the microphone. I have one. Oh, you have one. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> first, I have to say this is incredibly inspiring, and I have, like, I think this multiple girl crush on everyone here. It's just in love. Um, and um, for me, what made you go through this path with, which is so not egocentric? Because I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm not doing something which really benefits. I mean, it can benefit, but it's not like, it's not social entrepreneurship. And it's, I would like to hear what made you choose that path, which is so, uh, just not egocentric, and, and I think getting up in the morning for something like this is so much more difficult than for something that, you know, I don't know, might exit in 10 years or so. Okay, who wants to, Jammu, please. I actually uh, went to vote for the first time when I was 18 years old in Austin, Texas, and I was going to vote for Ann Richards, who was the current governor and uh, just an amazing woman fighting for social justice. And I walked up to the polling booth and was told that my name was not on the list and I could not vote. Um, even though I had registered to vote, I had filled out everything, I had sent in the form, I was turned away and I, in that moment, was disenfranchised. And also in that moment, I realized that there was nothing that was going to stop me from working every single day to make sure that that same situation didn't happen to another young person that someone who wanted to participate in the political process was going to be blocked. And so I think, you know, a, a big part of my path has been when I was stopped as an individual, and that inspired me to make sure that other people didn't have to go through that same situation. Wow. Let's see if we have another question, and then maybe other people can reflect on the same thing. Yes, do we have? Orly. Well, I think you are making a wonderful moderating uh, job with this dream team, <laughs> star team. This is really outstanding. But something that I want to know, I really want to know what makes you wake up in the morning. What is your vision? Can we learn a little bit about yours? Um, no, it's breaking the rule. Moderators are not talking about themselves. But you're more than welcome to email me at edit at worldwideworkshop.org and I'll answer that question. This is my good friend and I can easily sit and present with my colleagues, but today I'm the moderator. And uh, it's about being non-egocentric. And I, I will, I'm, I'm an education uh, innovator with technology and I can tell you personally about what I do too. Yes, did we have another question in the back? So my question is, um, um, 
when you do social entrepreneurship, um, it's many times not just starting a process, but also encouraging others around you um, to do the same and kind of spread in contagious way whatever it is that you're doing. So my question to you is, how do you encourage people around you to be a part of your mission? Who wants to take that one? How do you encourage other people? Do you want to take that? Sure thing. Juliana. Um, it helps to have a, a clear mission uh, of what it is you'd like to do. We were very fortunate that um, Ushahidi, first of all, it was born out of a crisis. Um, in, in Kenya, we had post-election violence, and I think the way we began was we were trying to answer the question, how can I help? What, is, what, what of value can you do personally to assist? At that time, we were seeing um, incident reports from uh, regular people that was not ending up in mainstream news. So we wanted to use the internet to bring all these voices together and to present it in a way that makes it powerful. So I think first sort of try to answer that question. How can I help? Because more often than not, you will also connect with others who are trying to answer that same question. And I think that will make you connect on a very deep level that will then propel you to collaborate and work together for a common goal. So that's almost like an answer that is combining both questions. Anybody else want to take this one or the previous one that we got? This one too. About how, how, not, how, how come we are not selfish and thinking about others and also, yeah. Well, I Which one do you want to yeah, answer? You wanted to answer that one, I wanted to answer it. Can I follow on and then you go? Yes, yeah. okay. okay. So, so Mitchell will follow on on this and then you can take the first question. Let's go. So I'm gonna follow on Juliana's because having, at least our experience has been, having a mission is important that people care about. Right. Uh, there is a point, at least we found, where real leadership was required. Not just coordination, not just a group of people working together, but someone making decisions and leading and being inspirational and figuring out how to articulate the message and how to articulate it to new people and how to chart really difficult decisions when you're trying to do some blend of things people haven't done before. And that's a very different level. Like, I never wanted to be a leader. I always wanted to be anonymous. That was my goal, <laughs> behind the scenes in life. Here I am, yes, right. Uh, but it turned out that Mozilla needed a leader. And so there is the mission, and some projects succeed quite well in a general collaborative, consensus-based, group decides. So, so you've got to figure out which of those, if you're in one of those or not. But if you're in one that where you know, we really benefit from leadership, then someone has to actually step up. And, th and then you get into all these issues of loneliness and making mistakes and, and, and just making decisions people are going to hate you for and tell you how ugly and dumb you are. I mean, then you get into all of that. But, but if you have the right group and the sense of what you're doing, then just on you go. Joanna, do you want to follow that? Well, I, th I just wanted to follow your question about the egolessness, because I think we are not at all egoless. I mean, I certainly, you know, the people I know who work in this field, we have really rather strong egos. But I think, you know, when, when I think, wh why would I get up in the morning? I mean, I think it's so much more motivating to solve a social problem than, you know, to make more money or to be, you know, more in the media or whatever. And I mean, I love Mohammed Yunus who says, you know, when I see, you know, when I see a social problem, I create a company to solve it. And I think that's the path, you know, which more and more our people are following. And I find, I mean, I get so much ego, you know, nourishment because I meet the most amazing people. You know, we are, I mean, we are really, you know, you meet so many inspiring people who give you much more back than you give them. And so, you know, it's, it's, there is the ego definitely in there. And just, just adding on that point, I think we are in fact actually all being very selfish because we're doing exactly what we want. Aha, sure. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I want to stop just to see if there is another question. And if not, there is one burning question, okay? Maybe, until you get the microphone, Isabel? Sure. Um, I think the word might be healthy ego. We have healthy egos. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to say something about drivers, actually, because the word quickly came up here. Many people's money is drive, is, uh, my, driver is money or power or could be religion or whatever. My personal driver is, and it came from, from, my, from growing up, was, is communication, because I do think that gigantic amount of ills in the world are due to lack of communication, poor communication, which leads to ignorance and fear. And actually, that really was my prime driver, and I apply that wherever I am, whether I was in high-tech or film, 
or water business or anything. It, it, that's my continual driver. Thank you. We'll take another question. Yes, please. Thank you. Can you say who you are? Sorry, does this work? Yeah, it will work if you start talking. Okay. It's magic. Okay, excellent. Okay, my, my name is Mila. Um, I work in development. And actually, um, we've heard the, the word social entrepreneurship quite a bit now. I'm not sure we have a common understanding of it. Great and I would be curious if there's a panelist who is heading an organization that is actually for profit, but with the aim of um, you know, having a positive social impact. And maybe whoever answers the question could maybe give you know, their own understanding of social entrepreneurship. I think That's that would really be very helpful. That's a really great question. It was on my list too. It will be a good thing actually to go, but really fast. Say if you're for-profit, non-profit, and what is your really two words? What is social entrepreneurship? Okay. I actually have run social entrepreneur program in Israel. We have 18 social entrepreneurs on the ground. Two and words. A social entrepreneur is an entrepreneur whose basic mission is not just to make money, but to basically help systemic social problems get better. That's the definition of a social entrepreneur. And to answer your specific question about social enterprises, it's a mixture. Some that we have, it's, they're all for non-profit, but they do within it have services that they make money on. Isabel's water project is for profit, but it's for social good. Okay, Jammu. Both. Yeah. I actually, the Women's Media Center is a non-profit organization. Rock the Vote is a non-profit organization. And most of my professional life has been in working with nonprofits. But I think within nonprofits, you can be entrepreneurial at Rock the Vote. One of uh, the best successes I think I had was when we developed an online voter registration tool to allow young people to register to vote over the internet. And then we realized that there were so many organizations who needed that, and so we gave it away for free. Okay. Constance. Ashoka is a not-for-profit organization with for-profit activities. And um, the definition of social, the word social entrepreneur was actually created by the founder of Ashoka, by Bill Drayton, and um, he used it to uh, describe um, an entrepreneurial person who solves a social problem. And so how he or she does it is really of no relevance. You know, the, the point is that the goal is an entirely social one. And so, um, shifting the focus from the traditional entrepreneur to the social side, you know, most of the social entrepreneurs are in, 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 in the, or many are in the not-for-profit field because they're dealing with, in areas where it's hard to, you know, set up a cash flow, flow system, for example, you know, human rights or education. Whereas in other fields such as healthcare, technology, environment, you know, it's much easier. So you actually get a whole spectrum from purely not-for-profit to hybrid models to, to for-profit models. So I think we, it comes in all flavors and there are non-profits that are actually generating profits and they're investing in the program. And uh, I think there are also a bit, a bit different ways of financing it and that's also legal issues and other things that relates to who are you raising money from and that will determine sometimes also the, the structure of just the business. Per, per, just to add to this. Just yeah. To add to this, I'm not a company. I am a co sort of an initiative within a company. So I came up with an idea and went to my chairman, presented it. I said, I, I'm going to do this. And he said, OK, stay here and take a day and a half of your you know, work week. And uh, you, know, we, you keep do doing your job. So it became the company's initiative. It became the company's project. So it's another model. Great. Is there any other model that you would like to talk about? No. Yes, because we are all doctors. We form um, Doctors Without Borders, Medicine on Frontier. And whenever there is a crisis, we all go out and each and every one of us give whatever we could afford to buy medication. And we all live in homeless tents, like you see in Paris in winter months. So it doesn't need to be an organization at all. It just needs a group of people with a heart and soul that is willing to give, that's all. <laughs> you want to add one dimension? Okay. Something we didn't say already, okay. <laughs> no, no, I just, I mean, we are non-profit, uh, but we do have a business unit um, which advises companies, so we do make money advising companies how to structure their CSR, their corporate social responsibility, and how to use the internet for that. But we've, all of the profits go back into the financing of our operations. So, and we found it very good that we have a real separation between, you know, the profit and the uh, non-profit areas of our work. So let's take one more question. Creating business models for this type of work in the world is very sophisticated and really challenging. Yes, please. 
Hi, I'm Eleanor. Um, being, well, thanks so much. <laughs> yes, thanks so much again. So I won a, um, a laptop. You guys, for being on the last panel, which really made me happy, um, you won a wish um, with God. So what would be your f desperate wish for God to fulfill? Do you want to start, Juliana, your wish? That African uh, women, or actually women around the world, can grow up with opportunities uh, that some of us were very lucky to have, a good education, and a chance to pursue their dream and to reach for the stars. Um, that you can be anything you want. You can be an astronaut, you can be you can be a microbiologist, you can, you can even be a farmer if you want, but that, that you have the option and the opportunity to pursue that. I think that's a really big, big wish. Big, huge wish for you. Number two, Suhua, what's your wish? That we can get rid of a lot of diseases that we all are facing as a doctor now. Wonderful. Mitchell, if you have one, I know you have a few. I heard some. Um, well, if I were talking to God, it'd be, <laughs> dear God, uh, you know, the human species is so amazingly malleable and we're capable of such astonishing acts of wonder and at the same time such unbelievable brutality and just uh, unspeakable horrors. And so my wish would be that we could remediate that end of the spectrum a little bit and move a little closer toward godliness. Beautiful. Amen. <laughs> well, I would follow up on Juliana and say that I would wish that more and more people have the opportunity to choose the kind of lives they would like to lead. Beautiful. What a great question you brought to us. Dear God, we are all created equal. We have hearts. Let us use it more. Amen. I actually wanted to say more or less what Joanna was saying, but now I can add another point that would be a transparency so that actually the good ideas and the good approaches that exist in the world are actually hurt and sinned and copied and not um, you know, being overlooked because those who have created them are not powerful or you know, do not fit uh, the, the, the mainstream stereotype. And the next wish, I have two wishes with God, <laughs> would be huge endowment. So I would have constantly Oh, that we share. Let's hold hands. For huge endowments. <laughs> I would have enough money to put all my ideas into practice, and I wouldn't have to go fundraising anymore. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I chant every morning, and one thing I've realized is that Every single day, the universe actually does give me the wish um, that I'm looking for, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is the opportunity to work with one mentor I didn't mention, Gloria Steinem, on a daily basis uh, to empower women, uh, whether it is to uh, you know, find that voice in uh, an individual who comes through our training program. I think it is really about uh, looking at your life every single day and seeing how our wishes are being delivered to us and uh, being open to accepting them and then amplifying them. Beautiful, thank you. Wow, and uh, I'm actually not persuaded there is a God because when I look at all the rubbish in the world, sorry, I am gonna make a wish, however. <laughs> and uh, actually- I'm My gonna... God is listening. <laughs> Whoever's God is listening because, uh, but, but I actually do wish that the, uh, there was no oil right now in this world. Mm. so that we could start getting off these fossil fuels the sooner the better. And I'm going to make a second wish, is that all the investment that's currently being made in men, a very good chunk of it should be made in women across the world because the payback is so, so much more. Thank you. Thank you. My wish is that we all meet again next year and that the DLD team uh, will decide that this was a really great business for them and they will bring us together again and thank you for all these great questions and uh we are really happy to be here today and share this and we, we all became friends and and this is a wonderful gift thank you steffi and thank you maria
thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for this wonderful panel, for this really admirable women. I'm so, so glad you were here, and I'm so happy that we could do this together. I'm so happy that Steffi challenged me to do this chairwoman's job. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. And just one thing to sum up the whole business. Caroline from the Women's Forum, you know, they're doing this like since six years, and she's, she's very used to all these women topics. She said, you know, that was beautiful and wonderful, but you know, we know in France, I mean, diversity is the only way and is the best way, and period. We don't have to talk about, you know, women are like this and they're fantastic, and you know, period. We just, and I told her, you know, in Germany, we're somehow, um, funny enough, we're really good in many things, but what is diversity concerned in Germany, we're a developing country. And that's why this conference is definitely important. I'm more convinced than ever we have to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. But please. You, you, you all know, you wonderful entrepreneurship friends, you all know that um, what you achieve is not possible without a team. So I'm very happy now to call upon stage our wonderful team. I mentioned the word wonderful. Yeah, 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 please. Come. Please come. Please come. Alex, this is Alex Scheer. She worked 48 hours. A day. This is Alex, Alex, Alex. Lena, Lena Kippel, Dani Schulz, Marie Sophie Bibra, Sabine, Sabine, Sabine. She has her birthday day. It's her birthday. Flo, Flo Haas, Patricia. Bravo to the team. Wow. DLD. Um, um, Bravo. Arthur. Francesca. Arthur. Arthur. Yes. Francesca. Kati Nachbar. Jonas. Jonas. Lukas. Uh, Philip. Bravo to the team. Really. Franzi, come to, to us. Come to us. Francis. No, it's so good. <laughs> Aren't they great? And Marcel. And no, Marcel. No, 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 no. That's the team now. Did I forget someone? No, a wonderful team. I'm really, really so proud of you. It's, it's, it's more than proud. I'm touched. And, and, I'm, and we are tired now. We are really <laughs> <Touched> tired. And, tired. <laughs> and you also. <laughs> and thank you, Maria. Thank you, you for our Thank you, Maria. Woman. Yes. Thank no, you. really. Come, come with us. No, picture, come on. No, picture, no, no. Uh, picture with us. No, 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 no. Uh, Woo. no, no, no. And thank you to you all. This was the first DLD Women Conference, and maybe your enthusiasm made us or makes us to have it next year again. Bravo. Woo. And of course, I see Ursula Schwarzenbart. Thank you to our partners. Thank, Thank you. you to our partners. Thank you, Ria Hendricks. Thank you, Ursula Schwarzenbart. There are many more, but I just see you. Thank you so much. Bravo.